Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO The New Order in which I'm your host Mr. Milk Lover and we're playing with a new update called So Far From God and we're playing as the United States or Mex United Mexican States not the United States of America but the United Mexican States now truth be told I know absolutely nothing about this and then I realized I should probably go back in my discord community sometime but whatever um, so yeah, we're here, we're playing as Mexico, we're led by Adolfo Lopez Mateos. He, this guy was either the child of a dentist and teacher in Mexico City, or a bastard from Guatemala who faked his Mexican heritage to fulfill his political ambitions. The story is under dispute with the latter theory having special prominence among his detractors. However, the documents he provided in the only official inquest in 1946 evidently were enough for him to be placed above suspicion. This minor speed bump did not stop his ascent from secretary to the state of Mexico's governor to its senator and president of the PRI, the Mexican ruling party. From there, it was a mere matter of friendship and dutiful service to President Ruiz Cortines, or Cortines to place him as his successor, which guaranteed him an easy election not atypical for the PRI. Lopez Mateos' term was marked by continuation of the economic success and stability of previous presidents overall. Land reform, the building of museums, expansion of healthcare and education, and the nationalization of the electrical industry were all major successes. He also balanced Mexico's position between the sphere and the OFM, which has served the nation well and may have been the critical factor that prevented conflict between the two superpowers. However, not all has been well. Relations. With the PRI's union support has been sour and student groups collide with the government. Some are concerned that the PRI is blindly running away from the policies that have been successful for Mexico. And now Adolfo Lopez Mateos must take all of this into account in order to make his most critical decision. Who will succeed him in the presidency of Mexico? So we have about four years of content for this group. Um, a lot of despotism here. Uh, truth be told, like I said, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, no clue. But we're going to be averting some sort of crisis. Humanity's fate balances on a nice edge. A downed Japanese spy plan, a captured pilot, and allegations of American perfidy in the demilitarized Aleutian Islands have propelled the Pacific to the brink of war, Mexico. The lone neutral country with strong ties to both superpowers has been called to mediate the dispute before the Great or the Gold, Cold War goes hot. Caught between the mid-Pacific tour in Canberra, Australia, our President Lopez Mateos will harness every organ of the Mexican state, every reserve of diplomatic goodwill, and every fiber of his being to protect his nation and the world from the outbreak of World War III. His proposal for an even-handed peace, with Mexico helming a third-party investigation of both parties' claims, can and must be accepted. Humanity's last hopes are with President Lopez Mateo. So here's the economy as well. The last common thread. Um, we're, we're acceptable for now. We want to get to good. We have our own sphere, which I didn't know. Like I said, I literally know nothing about this. We maxed out social and admin expenditures. We're keeping science down for now. As much as I want to increase it, um, I've lowered all this too. So, U.S. and Japanese warships crashed thousands of tons of steel through the surf and freezing rain of the Northern Pacific. Why didn't they arms would destroy each other that began the short, sharp process of destroying the world? Mankind's slim hopes for peace, meanwhile, rode a thin copper cable from Canberra to Sydney through Hawaii to San Francisco to Washington, D.C. They clung to the exact calm words of Mexican President Adolfo Lopez Mateos. Stage withdrawal of both fleets and their return to the capital, Assault. Mexico also carried out an extensive investigation of the alleged treaty violations in and around the Aleutians. The sounds that followed them lasted 5, 10, 15 seconds long. Then the receiver crackled to life with the voice of President Richard Nixon, Adolfo, that's uh, not going to work. There doesn't need to be an investigation. The spy plane is proof. We can't uh, afford that time. I've got the line crackled, telling me there's going to be a nuclear war within the week. They ripped out of Mateos' throat, but he managed to choke out. I will raise your concerns with the foreign minister of Fujiyama, Richard. His voice was steady now, getting forced, but this investigation will take place following the withdrawals. You asked me to mediate this crisis, and I require thoroughly addressing both parties' claims. Silence again. Mateos' eyes were burning, but he watched a ripple creep across the Lake Burley Griffin below. His hands were white, clenching the receiver um, and a hotel suite's desk. Nixon again. Only two words? That's unacceptable. Owen's voice. Australian English, the operator. Your line dropped. Would you like to try to reconnect? Humanity's lifeline was taut, and war draws ever closer. The second president is next. Ooh, free military factories. Very nice, very, very nice. Um, we've got production units. Oh, military factories. I've been playing too much Oval Blues. So, military factories. Um, what are they? Did I do anything here? Um, do we have any planes? Super Saber, basic jet fighters. The North American T6 Texan. That's kind of cool. The Boeing C-97 Strato Freighter. I don't want to talk about Boeing this nowadays. nowadays. Anyways, Carl Gustav Aquilus Rifle. We got motorized. No, we don't have motorized. Ooh. Well, we need some basic motorized equipment. So that would probably be good for us. Yeah. Let's go with that for now. <clears throat> Three twenty-seven a.m. The hour judgment. Secretary of the Interior Gustavo Diaz Ordaz sat alone overhead, the fluorescent light illuminating his harsh features and the harsh facts before him. 
Hey Sam, unhappy with exhaustion. Fanned out report after damning report. DFS, FBI, the embassy in DC, the American's embassy in the federal district, his own notes. They all said the same. President Lopez Mateos was dragging the Pacific to war, the world to nuclear oblivion. Mateos' commitment to Estrada Doctrine of Neutrality had warped his mission to mediate the Aleutians' crisis. He insisted on equating Japan's phantom claims of treaty violations in the demilitarized islands with actual violation of American airspace by a concrete spy plane. Again and again, it pushed this futile useless investigation, ignoring the ever-growing risk of catastrophe in the north as two hostile fleets swelled and grew closer. After the serial collision today near Atu, a volley of sources stated that the nuclear exchange was imminent. Ordaz raised his head from the evidence. 3.31 a.m. If we could speak to the president, he, Mateos' most trusted confidant, could sway him, but Adolfo is somewhere in the air between Canberra and Tokyo, hours and hours ahead of him. And no, Mateos would be no help here. He was soft with the Japanese, drawing the matter out as he had the rail strikes. Talking and talking with what, when what was needed was a firm hand, and firm action. In the absence of the president, Ordaz had the power and duty to safeguard the Mexican people. 3.40 a.m. Ordaz wiped his brow, a simple, truly neutral proposition. A formal apology from Japan with the release of the pilot by the U.S. and a withdrawal of both fleets. He arranged for it to be sent to the Japanese and American embassies immediately. In time for a special edition of the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, a misstep that could plunge the world into darkness. Between the lines. Amid the restless traffic of the Paseo de la Reforma, a great surveillance van hit as Raul Serinas Lozano maneuvered his jet black Toyota to a halt outside the Japanese embassy, he wondered who its occupants were. Would it be Yankees or Mexicans that got him accused of treason? Salinas's schedule said that he was here as Secretary of Industry and Commerce for a routine discussion of Japanese foreign direct investment. It would not say that an official who arranged a meeting with Ambassador Hayashi Kaoru in the midst of the largest diplomatic crisis since the Second World War, following the bombshell peace proposals leaked to every American paper, sought more than a new factory in Yelisco. The even pressure of Salinas' handshake, the steady grin on entering the ambassador's headquarters did not betray a man taking the greatest risk of his life, the diplomat. Besieged by Tokyo's hostile questions and demands for the last 48 hours, gave the barest minimum of pleasantries before leaning back, weary eyes on the northerner. Salinas withdrew a bound folio and proffered it to the diplomat as he spoke. Despite these specific tensions, I want to reassure you of the fruits of Mexico's commercial partnership with the sphere. I'll cover recent trends before we discuss investment opportunities. Page 3, the heavy tap of his finger on the portfolio, contains the key details. Amidst the restless parade of grass and data, a message hit, or perhaps screamed, proposal created by Ordaz without Mateos or cabinet knowledge, do not withdraw from talks, Mateos will negotiate, or immediately to Tokyo. Ambassador Hayashi, uh, eyes wide, stammered that he would prepare a telegram immediately. Salinas, who had been keeping up a pattern of statistics smile for all his potential listeners, the economist declared, only with appropriate urgency, resolving the illusions must issue must come first. Blessed be the peacemakers, for they seek to inherit the presidency. You know what? How much more would we suffer from this? Oh, it's not that much more. Screw it. Slap it on. As we try to avert the crisis. The weight of the world. The deliverance or damnation waited on the other side of that door. President Lopez Mateo strained to keep standing. The pain in his head, the exhaustion in his sleepless body grew with every minute the U.S. ambassador to Japan spent conferring with Nixon by telegram. And so did the risk of another catastrophic escalation in the illusions. <coughs> he had entered this inferno. Upon landing at Hay... Hay uh, Hananda. The scant reception to him uh, had glares that needed no translation. At the Mexican embassy, a frantic message of Secretary of External Relations Baraud laid out Ordaz's borderline treasonous declaration to justly and expediently resolve the crisis. And the barrage of bile unleashed by Tokyo in response, Baraud and Secretary Silinus Lozano had managed to keep the sphere in the talks, but just only, by calling in every favor of their respective networks. And so Mateus had arrived in the room, in the suit, for 28 hours of hell. The American's initial submugness was replaced with a fury when he revealed that he could not, would not, enforce Ordaz's terms on the Japanese. The ferocious accusations of Mexican duplicity only quieted the news of another near miss of off Kisha, Okiska. Fear became a tale of threat as he weaved together a new agreement from these shambles. The release of Captain Aso, a detailed plan for fleet withdrawals, and no Japanese apology for the spy plane over a flight, Ordaz had ripped away any chance of an investigation into if and why the Americans had violated the demilitarization of the Lucians. With Mateos only able to secure the thin compensation of a covert spy exchange co favoring Japan in return. If Nixon torpedoed this agreement now, there'd be no other choice or chance. As the door creaked open at last, Mateos's breath caught in his throat. At the sign at the sight of a thumbs up and grin, he exhaled. The world can breathe again. How are you working on this stuff? Not bad overall. It's not bad. Also, I do want to say thank you to the uh, developers for making this update. The Mexican update, you know. Tino devs are pretty fantastic people. Peace in the Pacific. Solutions, crisis resolved. It used to be the Hawaiian crisis. Not solutions. Soviets, specifically. 
President Lopez Mateos, in an extraordinary fleet of diplomacy, has averted war on the Pacific. U.S. and Japanese fleets had gathered in the seas near the remote Aleutian Isles after a Japanese spy plane was forced down and the pilot captured. With warning shots being exchanged only days before, both civil powers are now gradually withdrawn from the region under the auspices of a deal negotiated by Mateos. This success reflects the strength of both Mateos' personal reputation and the rival powers in that of Mexico, whose responsible foreign policy is established as an invaluable neutral arbiter in a chaotic world. To our country and all humanity, oh, President Mateos, thanks. Absolutely. Also, there's a lot of reading, but that's, that's normal for TNO. The perfect dictatorship. The Yano's face of the PRI is only is one which prefers to present an appearance of democracy and accountability over one of repression. However, as inequality and discontent grow within Mexico, and corruption and factionalism plague the party, the carrot is steadily abandoned in favor of the stick. As PRI rules depend on the illusion of democratic structures, the situation cannot remain tenable forever. Meltdown. The icky blackness, inky blackness of the Pacific Ocean at midnight was punctu punctuated by blinding flashes wrenching Lopez and Mateo's awake. He scrambled for a seatbelt to yell to think one last time of home before it all ended. How could this all be happening? He had stopped the war. He had... Mateo slumped back down, creating his throbbing head as his heart slowed. The lights were not those of nuclear explosions, but only the worst migraine he had ever experienced through the stress, sleeplessness, and pain he tried to piece together some semblance of a thought. But waves of emotion won out, rage at Ordaz's insubordination and incompetence, shame at the Secretary's shattering of Mexico's neutrality and diplomatic reputation, fear. If war had broken out, if nuclear war had broken out, he would have been vaporized along with Tokyo. The plane flew through the gloom for hours more, the President racked with torment. But when at last he managed to look out of the window again, he saw the sprawling expanse of his native land below, glittering with rings of light as the electrification had made possible. Mateo saw himself upright, he had three more years, and would not surrender to this collapse. He would put Ordaz in his place, who would restore Mexico's global reputation and his own. He would fulfill his promises and those of the revolution, and with these weary eyes and aching mind, he had seen how. Glowing rings that could be seen across the globe were beginning our descent into the federal district. The president returns to Mexico. Ooh. Putting Mexico on the map. I guess a triumphant return. Humanity can breathe once more as Japan and the U.S. withdraw their fleets from the Aleutians' frigid waters. And so today is a day of celebration, with mankind escaping death's grip and our beloved president, M Lopez Mateo, finally returning home from across the Pacific. A time for smiles, speeches, and the Mexican people to feel proud of what their government has done, not only for them, but for the entire world. <clears throat> the streets are buzz once more, the people are joyous, and the reinvigorated president is preparing to meet with groups across the nation. Who cares if other countries ignore our role or worse, criticize Secretary Ordaz's shambolic intervention? Mexican newspapers and broadcasts state that we keep the pace. What right does even Mateos have to contest such a claim? So, the revolution brought us many things, but it has also reduced our global standing. Porfirio. Diaz was a tyrant through and through, but he managed to make Mexico a name across, known across the world. Under his dictatorship, industrials like from France, Britain, and the U.S. plundered Mexico, and when the revolution finally chased them off of our shores, the world at large seemed to forget about us in revenge. Now times are changing, and the president is determined to make Mexico known throughout the global game without selling its soul. Lopez Mateos has already visited many foreign countries in the first three years of his term, and so many that the public has begun to call him Lopez Paseos. Lopez travels. Before he can continue these efforts, the president must ensure that his domestic affairs are in order. Our star player. I like more loyalty, our front bench. Lopez Mateo has assembled a glittering array of talent here to for unseen in a Mexican cabinet. From revolutionary uh, legend Olachea to globe trotting Baraud to Harvard valedictorian Salinas, his secretary stand at the apex of their fields. But Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, the man that previously stood at the apex, has fallen. The Secretary of the Interior, so forceful and efficient at handling challenges to PRI rule, launched an unwelcome and calamitous foray into international diplomacy. Ordaz will be reminded of his place, and his ambitious peers will make sure he never forgets it again. Espionage in the Palacio Nacional Claudia was one of the dozen secretaries in the Palacio Nacional. They did not work on grand national matters or ruled any crises. This reminded of old men of meetings and occasionally brought them something to eat. When he joked that they were babysitters for politicians, today the babysitters busy themselves around the cracked door of the president's office. Claudia nearly asked why, but so was serotipically hushed and whisked off to strain not a, a not noticeably off kilter painting. The fierce voice of President Lopez Mateos, usually so amiable, pierced the air, explained to me carefully under which authority you awaited, or awaited uninvited into the most delicate diplomatic situation of our lifetimes. <coughs> Ordaz's own weary voice soon came after I had received credible intelligence of an imminent nuclear exchange. As you were in a flight and unavailable, I had to prevent a war. Claudia nearly dropped the corner of her painting when she heard Mateos' spiteful laughter. Prevent a war? Let me break, be frank, Gustavo. You nearly caused World War III. Your so-called terms were completely unacceptable to Tokyo and let the Americans get away with whatever the heck they were doing in the North Pacific. What's more, your credible intelligence came from Le Tempo sources and FBI agents. 
I should not have to remind you, our own Secretary of the Interior, that we use them to pass our word to Washington not to fill our ears with lies. You made Mexico look like a puppet of the Yankees. Why, Daz, you made me look like as much as an incompetent, incompetent dupe as you truly are. <coughs> Excuse me. Was this the end of Gustavo Diaz Ordaz of Palacios Number 2? If Claudia's fingers weren't so busy holding this darn frame, she would have crossed them for luck. She had always hated Ordaz's ugly mug, had your secretary's ears perked up as the president delivered his final verdict. You are lucky to have a job, uh, secretary, get out. I've had people locked in the Cumberry for less. Get the heck out. So, before we do that, I have no idea which way this goes, but something we should know is the Leviathan. So there's no crest right now. But the heavy tentacles of the PRI Leviathan must clasp a vast and diverse nation. Its corporatist framework encompasses workers through the CTM, the peasants through the CNC and the CNOP. A hodgepodge of middle class and elite groups includes the economically vital industrialists, intellectuals. Whether world famous authors or humble students are governed by a different type of licenciado, the omnipresent party bureaucrats and looking behind all the shadows of the secretive and bureau DFS. The more power these groups have, the more they can propel Mexico forward. But if that power exceeds their loyalty, so if loyalty is lower, they will become unmanageable and cease to provide benefits. Here there's an alternative to loyalty called corruption. Groups can be subverted with bribe and blackmail, offering a form of control. If that if one, that scales down the benefits of the power. <coughs> corruption benefits, unlike power, will not be deactivated if it's above loyalty. Corruption, though, has its costs, such as increasing the price of projects. If the past is any indication, the PRI's grip on these critical constituencies will be tested by a series of crises. The Leviathan, with its great mass and infinite instruments, must maintain its firm hold, or who knows what will become of Mexico. So we have the workers. Oh, they're pretty loyal. Oh, got a lot of cronyism, though. Which is not bad. I like less inflation. We have the peasantry. They're very, very loyal. We have the DFS, our Federal Security Directorate. Pretty loyal. Um, we have the int intellectuals. Very loyal. Uh, low power, though, which is fine for now. Uh, we have the industrialists. They're loyal-ish. And then we have the party bureaucracy, which is not as loyal. They have a lot of power, but not, not very loyal at all. So if anything, I think I want to get more loyalty from, first of all, everybody, but especially from the party bureaucracy so we can get some benefits from them because they have a little bit of corrosion, which is not bad. I like the taxable population because we saw earlier we're not, we don't have very much here. So uh, do we include them in? Uh, Mateos, Mena, Disorganized Leadership. Uh, I don't know. Keep my friends close. Go keep my enemies closer. So you still have a job. We'll see. <clears throat> the Mexican miracle. Ooh. Main of, of the miracle is expensive, and every two years, both minimum social spending and civilian spending factor will increase by 5%. Oh, so Americans' business opinion of us is 10 out of 25. Together with American influence, our economy grants us the following bonuses. Oh, so this is from everybody. Japan and our own influence. Mexico has seen a decade of unparalleled economic growth, never before seen in the country's history. The population boom, the increasingly important presence of the middle class, and the exponential growth of quality of life and private and public businesses prove that the last decade's fortune shows no sign of letting up anytime soon. Moreover, the presence of foreign investors from the United States and the sphere proven to be a great boon to our continued economic prosperity. However, we must take caution to not let this boon turn into a burden. The government must balance the interests of both foreign and local investors to ensure that this miracle does not falter, lest the American <coughs> Mexican dream is lost. Yeah, there you go. Rising sun, rising star. Uh, Raul Salinas Lozano's discreet favor to Japanese diplomacy in the heat of the Aleutians crisis is being amply repaid. Japan's foreign ministry had arranged for the top names of the sphere of manufacturing and finance to attend the Secretary of the Industry and Commerce's uh, fit at Alcapulco's most luxurious hotel. The economist took to this podium, as he had for years of teaching, and began an ac accented but scrupulously correct Japanese. I am honored to host all of you today. Our government felt that it was imperative to quickly address any concerns resulting from the recent Pacific crisis. Many expressed surprise over the tone of a document sent to the U.S. and Japanese embassies. That document had not been reviewed or approved by the president. Afterwards, it made it clear that Ordaz was responsible, just as he had through numerous party channels. The former shoo-in for the presidency was to be as tarnished as possible. I wish to reassure you that our administration's policy remains unchanged. Mexico is a neutral nation, committed to working uh, with partners across the world in pursuit of co-prosperity. <clears throat> Our nation possesses ample natural resources, an able and rapidly expanding workforce, and through enviable geography, access to markets across the Americas, especially as a backdoor to the massive northern one. I guarantee you that those opportunities will only grow. Thank you. The speech was over, but real work had yet to begin. Salinas and strategically picked members of his team would gladly hand for hours, disseminate data and optimistic analyses, give personal gifts of Mayan curved jade, and wine and dine late into the night. As Stern and Zaibatsu's executives crumbled but one by one, pledging to increase their investments from Mexico, in Mexico, so this knew he would catch President Lopez Mateos' attention. And if the secretary could do all of this with a modest budget and weak to plan, imagine what wonders he could perform with proper backing. Scrawled on a napkin the word Naha 
What's in? We have promised development and we must deliver. A new decision category will be available. See wasn't playing for well, our star player. President Lopez Mateos cannot be more different than his drag predecessor, Cortinas. His glamour, good looks, boxing talent, taste for fast cars, high culture, and fine women. Yum. The Mexican people are enamored with him, and he has returned that affection tenfold. With three textbooks, ejidos, food support from the poorest, and rural electrification. Yet Athens makes a heart go yonder. Lopez Paseos, as a column, has wooed the world with his charm and diplomatic nose. But it left the party back home bereft of its popular face. So roll and tour of the nation will reignite that spark. He'll remind the people of what it was and what he has done for them. And what glories await. The president may even drop a hint of a ring or, or five. So, the Mexican miracle. Oh. What is this? Ah, so economics stimulation. Um, request. So we have all sorts of different things here. My god. The devs have done so much for this. It's a lot of debt. It's slightly inactive. Slightly inactive. Slightly active. It's moderately active here. Economic stimulation of the CDMX Mexico and Morelos is 58.2%. Every two weeks, economic stimulation decreases by 1.8 towards the floor of 50. So it hits 50% no matter what. So what is this? <clears throat> Economic activity and growth briefing stimulation promotes regional GDP growth through short-term economic activity. For every 10% stimulation, regional GDP growth increases by 0.2 points. It decays toward a baseline. Annual development objectives. So we need a GDP goal of seven, almost 18 billion US dollars. GDP growth goal 6%. Agricultural productivity rate 52.1%. Unemployment 47.9. Wow, that's really bad. Poverty 60.4. Show economic decisions and detailed economy tooltips. Nothing there. Sponsor. Oh, so this is where we spend our political power. Um, let's increase stimulation, increase unemployment, better unemployment, but we'll get more debt. State industry. 10. We want to focus more on pop uh, unemployment or stimulation. Resource extraction. More stimulation, more debt, of course. And what is this? When selected. No more stimulation, better poverty. Our quality of life goes down, though. Worker low to decrease. Industrial activity will increase. So this is all this stuff. Subsidized mechanization. Ooh, which one's the best one to do, though? Stable versus cash. Half of it is dedicated cash crops, all to be exported. Half of it is dedicated to staple crops. Okay, so half and half. Altogether, Mexico nets a total of eight production units gained from agriculture nationality. Now nationally. So, what is this? Expand cash crops or staple crops. So, this one gives you more stimulation. Better farming productivity. Better cash crops, but worse staple crops. More debt. Increase our liquid reserves. Ooh, but this one's not bad. Expand staple crop plantations. More stimulation. Better farming productivity. Better staple crops. Worse cash crops. Get more farming productivity again. And you get poverty rate will begin to slowly improve. I like that a lot. So, we've look at this one. Industry. We have agriculture. We've got population. Ooh. Most of our nation is, ooh, urban, 80% 80 urban, 20% rural. Interesting. Every month, about 0.112 of the populace in the region migrates from the countryside into the cities. Ooh, about half of this migration will translate into unemployment. Unemployment at 50% measures Mexicans not working in formal economic sectors. Truly unemployed, gray laborers, itinerant farmhands. So of workforce decreases the quality of life in urban areas by 5%. Further, the cost of the region, 35.81 million monthly. Build public housing. More debt. I don't like more debt. I hate debt. Personally, I hate debt, but sometimes you have to use it. Rural quality of life. So, oh, here's unemployment and here's poverty. Holy crap. Yeah, we gotta, we definitely gotta focus on this. Um, so, build public housing. Worker quality goes up. That's not bad. I like that. What is this? Rural quality of life goes up, but that, but we have so much that's already urban. Stimulation's nice. I don't want to decrease worker loyalty. Slightly decrease, well, very slightly decrease industrial. Okay, and then what's this last one? Oh, quality. Oh, so here's quality of life. Population. And then we have this, and there's not much we can do. So this is urban migration. Quality of life for local urban areas provides 77.5%. Sustaining it costs 27 million a month. Urban infrastructure mitigates a bi-weekly decay of economic stimulation by 
We estimate the urban quality of life is 35% better than that of the rural, rural regions. Quality of life in here is 42.5%. So stating this costs 3 million monthly. The rural quality of life is 35%. Worse than that, accelerates urban migration. So we increase, if we increase the rural quality of life, that decreases how many people want to actually migrate out of the areas. So let's come back over here real quick because we don't we honestly don't get much political power. I don't know if we need to save it for later. Um, I would like to increase the rate at which we're lowering poverty. When is our gold deadline? Economics briefing. Oh man, our growth has been all over the place, but it's still positive, which is good for across the thing. Regional debt simulation. Okay. Um, There's that, there's that population. <clears throat> and then we have proyectos, well, probably projects. Construction. Um, federal highway, corruption. Increases our project costs. It's average worker cronyism, industrial corruption, and party crookedness. Individual projects. Locked. Aruchiotu has been dealt with. Ew. Drainage system. That costs a lot of money. So how much money? So we just added it to the debt, I assume. <clears throat> Better base stimulation. Quality of life goes up for the urban population. Quality of the rural population goes down. Can we start this? Wow, there's a lot of things that we can do. New electricity plant. Get another production unit. That's nice. Um, new international airport. I like this because you get more loyalty. I like that a lot. Um... Elotentia. Quality of life goes up. What is this? Museum. Uh, quality of life. Research facilities will improve upon completion. That's not bad. Urban quality of life. Oh, this is in progress. Federal Highway. So this is what we're doing. Particularly funded. Uh, Federal Highway 150D is one nearing completion already, but requires some additional construction until it can be fully finished. Stretching from the Veracruz to Mexico City, it'll be one of the most vital highways connecting the country together. So, so it takes a certain number of days. Is there any way we can stimulate this? Also, if you know anything that can help me out with this campaign, please let me know. I would appreciate and love uh, some help. Because I know we can't do all this, probably, I assume. I have no idea. So, where is that? Public housing, property, 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 property. Agriculture, organization. Peasant low to increase. Look at reserves. I like that a lot. Ah, this one. So we get more stimulation. Uh, if we do both of these, you get more liquid reserves, which doesn't help all that much right now. Um, just to balance everything out, get more stimulation. So, is this for specifically just? Oh yeah, it is specifically just for the Southwest region or wherever you do it. Ooh. So you want to do this where uh, things are quite productive, because like here, doing it in the Yucatan agricultural stuff, it seems like it's not really worth it. Um, they're unproductive. So you want to get the max bang for your buck, probably, um, where they're very productive. Yeah. So, for example, we're going to do it... Uh, oh, they're also very productive in the Gulf. So staple versus cash is 50-50. Local productivity contributes 0.7 production units to the nation. Mechanization also accelerates urban migration. Decreases the regional cost by 25.4 million. That's not bad. Um, the top one gives you some stuff too. Over here, because it's un more unbalanced. Interesting. Decreases the region. So let's do it up here then, maybe. Cash versus staple. So. Power to begin to slowly improve too. Rural quality of life does go up. A little bit less farming productivity. Um, peasant low to increase. And get more political power back. I don't mind that one. So can we do that in multiple areas? Oh yes we can. Well, eventually. Set it as mechanization. More stimulation. Or do we want to do something else? Uh, sponsor industry. I'm sorry I'm taking so long with this. I just I have not looked at this before, so 
front. Employee magistrate industry. Production for resources is nice. Quality of life for urban workers goes down. More unemployed. Better unemployed. What is this? 50% chance of sphere or American influence will increase. Rural quality of life goes up. Better stimulation. Oh, what's this? Project available. Um. I'm gonna call. Oh. Occupancy. The Kotzalkoltos Bridge. This is partially complete. Massive bridge of the Kotzalkoltos serves a rapidly expanding petrochemical industry across the river from the city sharing its name. The first in the area, upon completion, it'll include a massive drawbridge to facilitate shipping in the river, a long term investment that will provide a massive boost to the local economy for decades to come. Oh, that'd be nice. So, how can we see which projects we have not done yet? Not started, okay. So this is going to cost a lot of money, so how much can we spend here? It's very rural. Cancun, Federal Highway. Okay, so these are uh, kind of generic-ish. Simulation decay goes, gets better, which I like. Simulation decay. 7 million, that's not bad. 112 million is quite a bit, though. Quality of life does go up for everybody, though, which is nice. What was this? New electricity plant? Better unemployed population. Rural population goes gets worse. Well, yeah, it's actually not too bad. Getting another production unit. 30% chance of getting a production unit. It's not bad, too. Uh, 1,250 days. 500 days. I'd rather get this, maybe? Oh, but then again, we'll go this one. Federal Highway 307 is to run from Cancun and the Yucatan's northeast to Chet Numal on our southern border. From the Caribbean coast to the wild jungles of the interior, the highway will offer an unforgettable drive to the legions of tourists soon to descend on the peninsula. The economic development they bring is critical, but so is integrating this from a corner of Mexico in the greater whole. Oh, corruption's really high. Simulation impact. Oy. It only takes 125 days. Uh, so is there a way for us to see uh, which areas have this besides, like, just see it on the map? Because that'd be really nice. Um, this highly beneficial reward of this project will be determined through an event chain. International airport. I want less stimulation loss. Base stimulation goes up, which is nice. Yeah, that's good. New International Airport. <clears throat> yeah, we'll do this one. An airport's vast array of buildings rises in a maze of runways extend. We prepare another city to receive the benefits of rapid, convenient international travel. Its businesses will be enriched by global investors. Its culture exposes the worldly tourists. Its own citizens will venture farther abroad and returning home with new insights and a greater appreciation for our own beautiful country. Nice. It only takes um, two months. That's awesome. Uh, not started. Let's see. Francisco Zarpa, damn. Get a you actually just get a production unit. Quad Black goes up, I like the political power. We'll get another thing there. It's not bad. Locked. What's here? I want stimulation to decay less. Production unit would be nice. Ah, new international airport, of course. It doesn't take too long. Boop. Base stimulation. Oh, 600. Oh, shnackies. Well, whoops, 600 days. That's a long, long time. Simulation helped out the one in Baja, California, quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> I should probably read how long it takes to actually complete these things first. 500. Simulation decay. PM, uh, P PMAX expansion. So our state-owned oil firm is among Cardenas' most viable legacies for our nation. We cannot rest on his laurels. PMAX must be expanded. <clears throat> Pemex must be expanded, of course. Strategic investments in production and refining capacity to increase output for international export and a growing domestic consumption. Sure. No project started yet. 500 days. So we invested a lot, I guess, in Baja, California earlier, was it? Maybe? And then that's why it got better for us? It was faster to produce things. New International Airport, 600 days is a long, long time. Mm. Yeah, tons of airports. No active projects. Let's see where we're at. So we're locked. So we don't have to look at that one. New electricity plant. Ooh, new industry airport. Uh, we'd rather air base for more money. Urban quality of life. And this is in the southwest. It's moderately rural, so we don't get as much benefit of urban quality of life, which is still good, but 
minus 0.2, minus 0.2, base stimulation. You get more stimulation here. Look at that one. And what are we missing? Hey, we finally get to the next day. Cool. El uh, Cicillon del Sureste. For most of its history, Tabasco had been considered a backwater of Mexico and isolated, ignored, forgotten, and life had stayed as it was for decades now. Everything had changed, and the man currently standing over the balcony could claim his share of the credit. He had paved and lit the streets of Vela Hermosa. He had built a malasson along the Grivjavala River, and he ensured the road network of his state was fully integrated with that of the rest of the nation. Governor Carlos Alberto Madroz, Madrazo Bacera was going to be one of the most accomplished governors of the brave new world that a state found itself in. But that brave new world had been turned upside down. First, it had been nearly obliterated over some islands far more remote than Tabasco. And now news was spreading even here that Gustavo Diaz or Daz, a catastrophic error in the diplomatic crisis. Only hours ago, Manuel Mora had burst in and told him that Ordaz had released that first horrifically pro-American draft agreement without the president's knowledge or support. Madrazo had been stunned that Ordaz, hardly known as impulsive, could have thrown away Mexico's neutrality and independence, could have destroyed everything in an instant. The world had not ended. Uh, but the critics of Ordaz, a supposedly left-wing candidate, the moderate Cardinitas, Cardinista, the successor to the throne likely would. That left who? Olachea, maybe in that uh, bastard Salinas. Madrazo shook his head. The revolution could not survive another Aleman. Diaz Ordaz had destroyed his chances at a smooth succession, and now everything was in danger. Someone needed to step up on the left to take a spot, to continue building the work that Lopez and Mateos had started, to be the standard bearer for the PRI, the revolution, and, of course, for Mexico itself. Madrazo smiles he overlooked the city. Certainly he wouldn't mind being president. A uh, cyclone rises from the southeast. So that's actually better than we had earlier. Nice. Growth is a little higher. Good. Um, military austerity. You lose political power. Civilian austerity. Definitely don't want to do that. Temp tax cut. Gives us twenty. Only twenty political power, but we lose money, which I don't like. Um, and how is this going? Fifty-one. We're at peace. That's only what's helping us out right now. Oh. Operative computer. Romulio. I want Ernesto. All right. So what do we want to do here? So we're doing this one, New International Airport. It's almost, well, it's really good. So we invested in the Northwest, so that's why we put everything there too. Um, corruption is at still 40%, unfortunately. But there's really not much we can do. I mean, we've barely been playing this. Uh, very rural, moderately rural, slightly rural. Mm, we're building a bridge, occupancy. Oh, it's not bad. How about the Federal Highway? Stimulation. 55. It's not bad. Growth. Industry. Unemployment goes down even further. Quality of life goes down. Unemployment sub population gets better based at. No, that's not bad. Slightly increase, slightly increase. Stimulation goes up. Better rural quality of life. American influence will increase as well. Tourist campaign. Really want to do. This one here too, don't you? Source campaign here. Mm. Mechanization. So we're gonna do this so many times until it comes back again. Population, build public housing. Um, where is it for workers? Workers, DFS, peasantry. They're pretty loyal. I do increase these guys though. Hmm. Corruption. Inflation. Crum yeah, I mean, that much has really changed. I mean, it's just at the beginning of the game. Relief, quality of life. More stimulation. Both get quality of life. Ah, oh, or we could wait. Not this one. Uh, here. I oh, we need 30 political power to do this. Um, a more loyal opposition. At the hot, stale air of the meeting room, experienced a momentary hush as Pan's new elected president stood. As all things stand, we cannot win, began Adolfo Crislib Ibarroda. As much as he loathed the, his replacement as a party president, Jose Gonzalez Torres had to agree. His own, proof was, or his own proof, his own term, was proof enough of that. What few elections the PRI's superior organization, uh, resources and recognition had not delivered, uh, fraud and violence stole. A paltry six seats in the chamber of deputies was all that Gonzalez had to manage to claim. But where successor went wrong was his turn away from God and church as well as, so we must change Mexico, we must work, with the government to secure fair elections and not for our benefit, but for that all of all, of all Mexicans. Gonzalez wins as 
Glebe's cohort of young supporters applauded this barely cloaked submissiveness to the PRI. Gonzalez's own faction of staunch Catholic conservatives sat in sullen silence, a clear division that boded ill for the party's future. A Chris Glebe noticed the mixed response his passion did not ebb. Even in opposition, we must work to shape legislation to protect the values and businesses that sustain Mexico. We will not abdicate our responsibility to our countrymen in favor of a competent, uh, complacent detachment. If to escape inaction, we must cooperate with the powers that be, then so be it. For the sake of the nation, we must act. A sneer crept across Gonzalez's face. Chris Lee was no fool. One that would lead their party from the loving embrace of the Madonna to the murderous clutches of the Leviathan. David extends a hand to Goliath. Hey, 0.75 is better than what was before. And come back to that. Yay. Increase uh, consumer good consumption by 10%. Thus, their political power. Allows for fine tune how many consumer goods our populace is provided with. For providing more, both our economic growth as well as stability will benefit, but we'll also need to devote more of our resources towards securing consumer goods. We can also lighten the burden by providing fewer consumer goods in exchange for lower economic growth and stability. So, we want more economic growth as for the country as a whole. So, this is looking already better, which will help this out too, right? Eventually. Uh, someday, maybe. But that's looking better. Green is good. Change comes from outside. The movement of national liberation was still in its infancy, or that's what its founding members told themselves huddled together in the back room of a local bar in Mexico City. The MLM was founded by General Lazaro Cardenas to continue the monumental task of agrarian reform in Mexico. Now, Cardenas, Gilberto Oranzon, and several other men had gathered there on the six-month anniversary of the MLM's founding to discuss the organization's future. If we to truly make the impact we wish to make in Mexico, we must seriously bolster membership, Cardenas explained. Perhaps we could apply to the CNC, Oranzon asked. It'll give us a large, far larger platform and could even attack the corporate system from within. Absolutely not, one of the other MLM members exclaimed. Give it to dismantle the this rotten system, we cannot also partake in it. He's right, Gilberto Cardinia said. The PRI and its centrals have already shown that they do not care about fulfilling the revolution's promise of land reform. To try and change the system from within would we'll be wasting your time. Instead, we must show the peasants of Mexico that the CNC monopoly over our, their lives uh, need not continue. We must show them an alternative. You're not seriously proposing that we compete with the CNC, are you? Or in some mask. Indeed I am, he said with a smirk. And a revolutionary agriculture. Oh, that sucks. From the revolution demands for Tierra y Libertad, the Ejido system of collective agriculture was born under it. Federally owned land is allotted to peasant communities who work the land in common, which initially granted a much larger degree of autonomy to the Mexican peasantry than ever before, however. The system is plagued by political negligence and corruption, and is far less profitable and efficient than modern ag ag agronomic practices brought about by the Green Revolution. Taking down a peg. It's good to see your faces again, Lopez Mateos announced to the members of his cabinet. There were moments when I wasn't sure if I'd make it out of Tokyo. As you may know, my, my mediation was ultimately successful despite our Secretary of Interior nearly ruining everything. Gustavo Diaz Ordaz fought down the urge to wince. The President was mad at him, yes, but his anger was surely past. The two men have been friends for many years, but Ordaz was already a reliable right hand and Mateos still needed his help. So now, Mateos continued, on to business. Ordaz stood up, ready to present at first, as he always did. Secretary of Mena, would you lead us off? For a moment, Ordaz froze, surprise evident on his face, before ignominiously sitting back down. Ortiz Mena struggled not to laugh as he began to report uh, on the economy. After he finished, the president asked another secretary to report, and then another pointed the skipping Ordaz. A few looked towards Ordaz sympathetically as they stood, meanwhile, Salinas reveled in his humiliation. After every other cabinet member had presented, Ordaz rose to give his report on the internal sec security. Your Excellency, I. Mateos put a stand out. I'm sorry, Secretary Ordaz. That's all this time we have for today. If there's anything urgent in your report, please put it in writing and forward it to my office. The man, the higher man rises, the harder he falls. Hey, poverty's looking better too already, which is great. Uh, poverty rate is not going to make a huge change yet, but we're getting there. You know, a tourist campaign. Uh, economics, uh, slightly an active population, very rural. They got a lot of debt. So how do you fix the debt here? Urban quality of life. Winston's web. In a nondescript office inside the U.S. Embassy building, Winston Scott stared at a large cork board. It was covered in photos, most can mostly candid shots taken from a distance, of Japanese agents and the contracts within the Mexican government. Red strings connected them together, revealing the web spun by America's adversary in its own backyard. The FBI here was monitored and contained this infiltration, a task it had been trusted with since the Second World War. Impressive as the image board was, it was not Winston's greatest accomplishment. The FBI bureau chief was far more proud of the intelligence network he had been able to assemble, a network reaching to the highest levels of the Mexican government his baby, Le Tempo. Over drinks, over envelopes, and occasionally briefcases of pesos, Winston had ascended step-by-step step up the ranks of Mexico's bureaucracy and security services. 
When Washington asked a question, he got an answer. When the Mexican government moved, he knew exactly where it was going, and when President Nixon wanted Mateos' mediation proposal quashed, Winston fed or does whatever he needed to hear to make that happen. Yet what should have happened was his crowning achievement was proven to be a double-edged sword. Lopez Mateos furious at the FBI for humiliating him on the world stage. Important contracts or contacts were suddenly reluctant to pass on information, and the mood in the government was growing more hostile to the U.S. Winston's gaze fell upon a specific photo, Major Onodera, the highest-ranking Japanese intelligence officer in the country. Japan's network of informants was small at the moment, yet if given the opportunity, they could spread across Mexico, perhaps even into the U.S. The political situation was incredibly volatile, but throwing his weight around now would only anger the Mexicans further. All he could do was wait, watch, rebuild a network, and prepare for the battle to come. Scour the talent. Simulation. Maximum investment admin funding. I like more, uh, that too. Ooh, this would be nice. Stabilize the team. Sport. Worker, peasant, but it doesn't help with other groups, so let's do it. Stabilize the playing field. We need pesos for infrastructure, pesos for social support, pesos to keep the governors in line, pesos to ensure this now rocky succession goes more smoothly than in 1952, and we know where to go with them. We'll check in with the Secretary of Hacienda and Public Credit Antonio Ortiz Mena to make sure our public finances are in order after the recent diplomatic crisis. If all goes according to plan, our miracle worker will procure another set of impressive growth figures, low inflation statistics, and favorable prospects for international borrowing. For borrow we shall take another step along our steady road towards becoming a developed nation. Good. So when do we get this one back? We're still working on this, okay. Subsidized mechanization, farming productivity. Very productive, very productive. Quite a bit of debt, 1.9 billion, 2.2 billion, ooh. More stimulation, farming productivity goes up. Be even more productive, yes. Look, 12 disciples. How surreal it all was, dressed in his Sunday best, Enrique, a first-year law student and first-time pan-campaigner, stood amongst fighters for liberty. Stood before his hero, Salvador Rosas Magallon. Enrique had heard him speak before, of course, had greedily sought every f speech on freedom, eagerly tracked every tract, in fact. But it different to be one of the few brave arguing for genuine democracy in Mexico. Pride shivered throughout Enrique's frame, smiling he took eyes away from Rosas, just for a moment to see his fellow's joy and passion for the cause. He did not find him. The eleven campaigners in the room each carried a different expression. A gr certain grim determination from an elderly man in the corner, a ha hangdog, look on a scruffy specimen, distaste and anger from the middle-aged woman fingering rosary beads in the back. The last he would have understood if a PRI politician were speaking but for Rosas? Enrique shrank back a bit. His court may have been, not been of what he was expecting, but that didn't change what he needed to do. And if anything, he just needed to work harder. And to show the pan's cause with more folks and with a broader grim. And so he turned his eyes to his, his mind farther from the speech, farther from the campaigners to the door where the streets of en Ensenada beckoned. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers few. There's no we did that. We have, oh, we still tend to build a prison. Nice. A report on our progress. Andrea leaned, or Andrea leaned back towards the radio to fit with the volume, making sure it was just loud enough before making her way back over to the clothesline. As she began to pin up the clothes one by one, she could hear the voices from the radio finally speaking loud enough for her to hear. His Excellency, the, the President Lopez Mateos, had just presented to the press an outline for all, all the goals he aims to achieve over the next three years of his government. His government will focus on steady and consistent growth across the whole of the economy, um, with particular focus on industrial growth and regions which offer new opportunities for the nation as a whole to share in connections to the world. He promises continued support of key social services, which will further enhance the safety and security of the nation. The government will introduce new programs to continue its policies to eliminate diseases that ravage our people, including tuberculosis, polio, and malaria. Additional new hospitals will be built in Mexico's rural areas, coupled with further reforms of child care to help the mothers of our next generation. Illiteracy has dropped markedly since the inauguration of His Excellency. His Excellency vows to continue the fight to increase the mental fortitude of our youth with government-issued textbooks to transform that way our children learn. This policy coupled with land reform will help lift hundreds of thousands out of poverty and energize our nation to new heights, as promised by His Excellency, now onto the weather. Andre began to tune out of the radio as she put her focus back on pinning the clothes. Her mind wandered to tonight's dinner. A long list of policies drifting further back from her mind. Mexico's prosperity marches on. The Leviathan. The vast party state bureaucracy of Mexico has loomed over the nation for decades, where worker, peasant, and boss alike are subsumed into a vast network of patronage and administration. While this system has steadily improved the wealth of the nation and standard of living for decades, it has also created pervasive corruptive corruption. Um, in all aspects of society, efficiency is consistently sacrificed for political expediency, compounding the financial and administrative burden on the state. And of course, the spirit of Bucarelli. Oh my gosh. That's terrible. Ever since the end of the Mexican Revolution, Mexico has attempted to seem as inoffensive as possible to the rest of the world. In 1923, Mexico signed the Treaty of Bucarelli with the U.S., showing the nation's willingness to negotiate to great lengths before resorting to arms. 
This period carried through the Second World War, as Mexico remained neutral despite mounting American pressure and would even mediate the peace talks between Japan and the U.S. Nowadays, Mexico, Mexico's Army, Navy, and Air Force have but the most bare minimum in funding thanks to a policy of mostly unarmed neutrality, making them international laughingstocks. Well, it could be worse. Truth be told, I'm not super upset with that one. Just because we, I don't want to spend much on the military. The tiger hunts. The peanuts. Uh, crunched up between the agent's teeth. He paused for a moment to savor the light. Or the light salt. When on stakeout, he played the long game, made himself comfortable. Much easier in this car than a ditch or a concrete floor. Heck, he'd done that before and would gladly do it again if it meant the commie or fascist put away for good. Which would it be this week? The agent knew his target was stealing military reports from this J job. And that was confirmed. But who was he passing them to? Could be a synarchist enamored with Trujillo? A spy for the gringos or an opportunist to out grab briefcases of yen from the Japanese. He met so many interesting people when he was working for the director of federal security. He swallowed and popped out another batch of peanuts in his mouth. It was a good gig, the DFS hack. It was the best gig. Use every instinct in his muscled body to track corner and beat the crap out of a scum that threatened his country. No one to hold him back. No one that he couldn't take down. Amidst the peanuts, he grinned. His grin looked an awful lot like fangs. An apex predator. Not bad. Not bad. The good news. The bus from San Diego turned to a halt and his tired occupants began to spill out of the square. <clears throat> Enrique positioned himself almost directly in front of his doors. Awkward, yes, but that was the price of democracy in Baja. As the workers attempted to move past, muttering, excuse me, Enrique launched into his prepared speech. Wouldn't it be better if you could find good jobs here in Baja? If the PRI's so-called union wasn't a joke, maybe you wouldn't have to go to the north for de decent pay. Larry's eyes rested on him for a moment, but he could tell most of his captive audience just wanted to go home. Couldn't PRI at least fix the potholes on the highway to give you a decent ride? They won't. Not because they don't have the money, but because they're too busy stuffing their pockets to care about hardworking citizens like you. That last line got nods, and Enrique even heard a few angry ascents. That's why we need a change. Fresh faces and a fresh party. That Panya, new voice for the state. Enrique's voice gave out as he was brushed aside by a sweat-soaked shoulder. The rest of the workers began dispersing, some even filing the bus to leave. One or two of them told him to keep up the good fight as they passed, but it appeared that liberty was no match for supper and a warm bed. Man does not live by pan alone. Walk in the park. The small former secretary of Hacienda and public credit. Antonio Ortiz Meña maneuvered through the Chapultec Park, uh, park mind-moving as fast as his feet. The financier dismissed the driver waiting at the gates of Los Pinos. His home was close enough, though perhaps this exuberant popcorn vendor would delay him as much as the federal district's notorious traffic. What a meeting. Lopez Mateos had laid out his plans for the final two years of his term. Expansion of social programs, school construction to complement those textbooks, and a vast infrastructure splurge with a port at Melcor Ocampo as his centerpiece. All bold, all costly, and what... Even more so if he wanted to build everything by 1968. Why 68? Finding the pesos to put behind presidential lands was Menya's job. They cannot be printed lest inflation slip its leash or the currency collapse. They cannot be taxed without endangering the industrial boom that represented Mexico's future. CNOP wouldn't stand for taxes anyway. Such were the strict structures of stabilizing development, the policy of the prison the Menya built for himself. But stabilizing development was also a solution. The trust he'd won at home and more importantly brought from year after year of growth, fiscal rectitude, Currency and price stability were enough to open the vault of the most tight-fisted banker. And so Mexico would borrow, borrow to grow, grow to borrow, and all worked perfectly until Menya strode through his front door, took in the 18th century French decor for a brief moment, and then darted off to a search for his wife, Marta. Asked her to arrange a dinner with the Rockefellers before heading upstairs to call Secretary of Commerce and Industry, Salinas, and former President, Miguel Aleman. He needed every one of their Japanese contacts, but then he paused and said, What's so special about 1968? Marta knew it immediately. So we got a little bit of money here, a tiny bit of money. We can invest it. I'm gonna pay off the debt a little bit. That's not gonna do very much. But it barely helped out. Barely helped out. It's something. Uh, it's team sport. Well, this one next. Got the talent. The PRIs offer the governors of Mexico a bow again. So long as they obey the occasional federal dictate and keep the state's party authority secure and economic growth steady, they're granted immense power and autonomy to oversee their fiefdoms, kings, for six years at a time. While most of these men reign as petty despots, a few show genuine political promise. We will seek them out, entrusting them with an infrastructure project that will secure national prosperity and international prestige. Perhaps it could even be de destined for higher office. Pretty nice. Ooh. What am I looking at here? Even better deficit than that. Uh, projects available? Not yet. And then we'll do a team sport. The PRI is more uh, uh, than a political party. It's a true legacy of President Lazaro Cardenas, a corporatist instrument ingrained into every aspect of Mexican government and society. 
the National Peasant Confederation, or CNC, reaches across millions of hectares of or to organize our farmers, while the broad tent of the National Confederation of Popular Organizations, or CNOP, te directs teachers, industrials, and our burgeoning middle classes. These corporations and the military, the PRI's vast base of enthusiastic members, will eagerly follow the standard of the revolution wherever Lopez and Mateos may point it. Yet the strongest corporate arm is the Confederation of Mexican Workers, the amalgamation of unions that holds tranquil the working class. To secure the CTM support for the upcoming succession, and then the President's bold plans, we will meet with uh, General, General Secretary Fidel Velazquez, Velazquez. A brief exchange. The U.S. Embassy was nice enough, but Winston Scott preferred to get out of the office and see things firsthand. For the FBI Bureau Chief, taking in the sights and sounds of Mexico City was an important, essential part of the job, as was getting to know some of the most important personalities. Uh, Chapul, uh, let, uh, Chapultec, Chapultepec Park was a lovely spot for a stroll. The street, trees provided shade and abundance, and once in a visit to the museums and zoo with his son and wife on occasion. Crowds of people milled about, with enough tourists and interspersed that the American's presence did not draw any particular attention. His eyes came to rest on a younger man, standing as expected, along the banks of the uh, lake. Le Tempo One did not see him approach, instead of gazing over the rowboats in the direction of the Los Pinos. After a brief scan told Winston that neither of them were being watched, the FBI took a position at the Tempo's one side. Family doing alright, he asked in fair Spanish. We've been better, the man replied, clearly annoyed. My uncle's in a bit of a bind. That tip you gave him proved to be a load of nonsense, and now that his boss is back in town, he's in a whole heap of trouble. Winston handed over the envelope, burgeoning with pesos, at least three times the usual amount. Tell your uncle to hold tight. We may not see eye to eye on everything, but we always take care of our friends. Two men exactly where he wanted them. Which would be great. And dazzled. <clears throat> The lights of the crystalline chandelier bounced and bent around the classical art and ornate furniture lining the Alcapulco Hilton suite. To the drooping eyes of the Secretary of Hacienda and in public credit, Antonio Ortiz Mena, they seemed to illuminate and refract off the countless invisible fil filaments linking this room, no, this man to the Mer Mexican miracle. The threads, the bonds between UNAM graduates, the generals lowering their guns to pick up a cigar, the Erashiai masses and welcome that rolled off on familiar tongues, the promises of low taxes and low wages kept, those of Article 1, 2, 3 forgotten, the bodies, some porcine, some toned for screen, all rich, 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 lounging in the sands below, the endless pictures to invest. Invest in factories, bombs, invest in the government that will invest in the roads, the railroads, power lines so you can invest in more factories, the oil, the spinning chandelier and glowing, glittering web, suspending a nation over the abund abject rumination and poverty from which it sprang, this man poised at its center, his mustache bristling like the hairs of a hunting spider. Former President Miguel Aleman stopped pouring wine. Perhaps I should cut you off, Antonio. Raul and I are quite concerned about Mateos' spending plans as you've relayed them over the phone. Secretary of the Commerce and Industry Raul Celenius Lozano added, taking another puff of, of his cigar. That was not, not my intention. We have adequate fiscal space for His Excellency's social spending priorities, which have the beneficial side effect of relieving wage pressures. The infrastructure expansions will lower shipping costs, provide both demand and supply side support for our manufacturers while keeping inflation in line. Mayor took a sip from his half full wine glass, watch the frowns fade from his colleagues' faces, and given your role in the Commission for the National Tourism, I understand if I understand the President's intentions are a golden opportunity in waiting. So we still have a little bit more loyalty, but they have now more power too. As long as everyone's loyal to us, that's all I care about first. Loyalty. You must be loyal. So overall, I think that's not bad for the first episode. We've done a lot. We've read a lot. But it's TNL for you. Um, yeah. Slightly unproductive. Ugh, not ideal. But that's for our economy. So I think we'll end it there. We're doing okay in the first episode. But it's the first episode. We'll see what happens. Maybe we can destroy Mexico. Maybe we'll make Mexico great. I don't know. But regardless, if you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow to see what else we can do with the United Mexican States. Thanks for watching. And have a great rest of your day.